Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for today's panel. Let's begin. Our conversation today will focus on the much needed work of anti-racism within our field and the promotion of people of color in the arts. You're welcome to engage in this conversation by using the Q&A chat function, which you will find in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. Should we not get to your question during the final 10 to 15 minute block of time, we have reserved for audience questions. Please feel free to reach out to any one of today's panelists individually. You will find their name and affiliation in the session description below. Head to their website and find their contact information. My name is Ashley Gordon, and I am calling in from the tra traditional lands of the Massachusetts people known today as Boston, Massachusetts. I am joined by a powerful group of leaders and artists, all of whom have taken active roles in engaging in cultural equity within the arts. With me are Armando Castellano, founder, artistic director, and French hornist of Quinteto Latino, Lucinda Ali Landing, violinist, founding director, and parent educator of Hyde Park Suzuki Institute, and Quanis Floyd, executive director of arts education in Maryland schools. I would love to start our discussion today with uh, allowing all of you the opportunity to share more about you and your, your work, uh, the organizations which I just referenced and certainly other organizations with which you engage. Um, let's start first with Armando and can you just share with all of the attendees how your work, uh, your organization um, addresses anti-racism and builds space for people of color? Thanks Ashley, uh, it's a big question. I'm gonna be as succinct as possible, but first I wanted to say that also I'm on the land of the Ohlone people here, I live in Menlo Park. I'm here at my home right now in my home office. And I love doing the native land chicken and thinking about who was here first. And what it reminds me of is the, the, of the histories of, of where we are that have been forgotten and cast aside so too often. And I like reminding myself of that history of who's here. And, it's just, and it feels like a similar, it's analogous for our classical music spaces too and the histories of classical music that now and in the past that are have been forgotten in our field. And so thanks for doing that and, and giving me the chance to say that as well. Um, so Quintato Latino is actually Latino Music Education Network, an advocacy organization, Latino Music Education Network with a uh, professional chamber ensemble, Quintato Latino at its core. So we do advocacy on behalf of Latino issues and um, Latino audiences, musicians, composers for the field as advocates for Latinos in classical music. Um, so your question about how do we build anti-racism in our uh, organization, I think it's definitely at the core and it's at our DNA because Quintato Latino has been talking about um, racism and um, the lack of diversity in classical music since our inception 18 years ago. And um, so it's in our communication, it's how we approach projects, it's, a, it's shown in our diverse team, it's shown that in our first board we have 85% Latinos on our board. And, um, and I think that's, I'd love to hear from our audience about it. There's another performing arts-based organization in the United States with 85% Latino, six out of seven of us on the board. And so I feel like we put that at the front. We talk about um, 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 racism and um, the lack of diversity in classical music in everything we do. It's, it leads our conversations. And I mean of every formal concert that we play, every fourth grade residency that we do, every community-based project that we do, we are talking about that as an issue and trying to um, build awareness about it, we, whether it's in the consulting that I'm doing or talking here today. And, and what I'm so grateful for is that in the field, it's finally palatable, that we're ready to have a beginning, beginning to wake up conversation now after 18 years, so I'm just, end with some gratitude for that period. Thanks a lot. Thank, thank you, Armando. And um, speaking of within the field, I, I would love to hear from Lucinda as it relates really with education um, and certainly the other touch points that you have and how your work uh, addresses similar issues around anti-racism and building space for people of color. 
Thank you, Ashley. And thank you for these questions, these prompts. I think they were very um, insightful and challenging, actually, for me to come up with. So my name is Lucinda Ali Landing. I am the founding executor, executive director of the Hyde Park Suzuki Institute, which is located on the south side of Chicago, near the University of Chicago. That's significant because um, of the population and the people who come um, to the music school. So we're, you know, we're just like any music school. We teach lessons, but because I am the founder and I am black, um, our our um, student base were first drawn to me. I'm sure because I'm black. Um, in terms of anti-racism, I'm going to mention the Chicago Sinfonietta before I go on to talk about the Hyde Park Suzuki Institute. The Chicago Sinfonietta, I'm a violinist with the orchestra and since its inception, they have been founded on diversity um, and issues around that there are a lot of BIPOC people absent um, and not on the main stages, major stages um, in classical music. But my work as an educator, um, it has not been an anti-racism. We as a board, as a parent group, as students, we did not speak necessarily with our out loud voices about anti-racism. Um, if anything, our work in anti-racism was just about being, being black, being excellent, um, being visible, um, and being intentional about our bold declaration of being simply the best which we received a lot of flack about that early on, but we still say it. Um, yeah, so so I think our, our anti-racism work has been about educating visually about who we are and what we can do, um, not necessarily to um, white folks, um, but to each other because we were visible to our own community and what was possible. I think there's so much power in, in what you said, Lucinda, about the visibility, about the intentionality of existence, about showcasing and being unapologetic of, of who you are. Um, and while that may not, under 2021 or 2022, the term being anti-racism, or prior to that, and I know, Quanice, you have thoughts on DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion, Prior to that, for centuries, decades, decades, right, we have existed, um, and there is definitely power and strength in that. Um, speaking of Quinice, I would love to hear your thoughts um, in in the work that you're doing. Certainly, uh, as um, with the arts education in in Maryland and other organizations that you're affiliated with, uh, how you are addressing anti-racism, what anti-racism means to you, and as opposed to DEI, and also building space for people of color. Awesome. Hi, everyone. I'm breaking the fourth wall and saying hi to the folks in the audience. Um, I'm so glad to be here and to speak to you all about anti racism work. So, I'm the executive director of arts education in Maryland schools. And I, in that position, I serve as a lobbyist. So, folks who don't know what a lobbyist is, is you register so that you can go talk to the legislative officials. And, and I'm particularly talking in the state of Maryland um, to our legislative body to ensure that. Um, arts education access reaches throughout the entire state and that all 900,000 students have access to high quality arts education. And so with anti-racism work in that work that I do with arts education in Maryland schools, we often realize Maryland is a very, very diverse state. If you go on the Eastern shore, you have, you know, the Eastern shore has the beaches, it has the farms. If you go to the West, you got the mountains. If you come in central Maryland, you got Baltimore city, you got, you know, DC suburbs. And so, one of the things that I've noticed historically is that those uh, counties where it was predominantly black, so Prince George's County, Baltimore City, Montgomery County, primarily black, primarily brown, for a lot of first generation dreamers or in those communities, um, they would take away the arts first because they say, oh, you're not hitting um, this achievement in math or science or whatever, whatever. And the arts is always the first one that they take out of those schools. And so when I say if someone takes arts education out of a school, then that is an act of violence towards our students. Arts education is a civil right for our students and our students deserve to have arts education as a part of a holistic education. 
Um, and so that is the work that I push forward um, with arts education in Maryland schools and being able to um, articulate that to our lawmakers so that education policies reflect the fact that arts education is a core subject in our schools. Um, another piece of that is that we do a lot of internal work for AIMS. So historically, AIMS has been um, a predominantly white organization um, with well intentioned, uh, you know, in making sure that students receive arts education. And so we're doing a lot of digging, um, internal digging and, and figuring out who we are as an organization and as a, a board of directors to ensure that no longer our biases get in the way of ensuring that our students get access to arts education that they need. Um, and then my second hat is that I am the executive director and founder of the Arts Administrators of Color Network. That is a volunteer um, position, but I, because I founded the organization, I put my blood, sweat, and tears into that organization and creating the space for black and brown, indigenous, people of color communities to come together, to be able to share resources, to uplift one another, to highlight one another, to share our stories, because we have too many people telling our narratives. And so this space is for us, by us, and um, and I understand how a lot of people might feel about that. And so at that point, at this point in, in the world, at this point in history, we do not care. We want this space to be for us. We want this space to be um, a safe space because oftentimes when we go into these institutions, there's a lot of racial violence that is happening. And so we need a space for us to continue to heal and to continue to support one another. Um, and then in regards to diversity, equity, inclusion, I actually saw an amazing post this morning by the social justice doula. And she talks about um, how multiculturalism isn't racial justice, right? Like uh, diversity isn't racial justice. Equity isn't racial justice. Inclusion isn't racial justice. Access isn't racial justice. And she says this because all of those, those key buzzwords often put white people at the center. They have them at the center. So diversity, oh, you're something different than white. Inclusion, oh, you're trying to fit into the white space. Equity, oh, we're gonna give you the resources so you could be a part of the status quo of whiteness, right? Like, and so I thought that was really powerful. And I saw that this morning, I got really activated. I was like, yes, because that is not racial justice. Every day we talk about racial justice, but then we all often conflict that with diversity, equity, inclusion, and that is not the same thing. Anti-racism and diversity, equity, inclusion are not on the same level. Sure, it takes, you know, it takes diversity, equity, inclusion to get to that. But right now I feel like we are so far ahead. There are so many lives on the line there are a lot of things happening and we need to step up and step out and do the work that we need to do. So, so powerful, so powerful. And um, hopefully this next question will, will allow our uh, panelists to engage with that and thinking about um, vantage point and perspective and literally shifting right around the DEI, which was buzzwords and now anti-racism is a buzzword. So what what perspective shifts new vantage point new initiatives new programs um uh that that you're suggesting Quanis, would would you like to see that aren't currently there or would you like expanded that are are currently there of course obviously your missions and, and organizations to be replicated but what other things would you like to see um to to help advance that perspective shift and um how about lucinda and certainly if there's anything else that you want to add on to um our previous conversation feel free Yes, thank you. And thank you, Kwanis. Um, I have struggled with the word diversity and then DEI when that came on later. Um, and even now the words anti-racism because all of that does still very much center whiteness. Um, <laughs> I am so glad um, that we are now speaking with our out loud voices my experience is that my generation or folks like me around my age is kind of like don't cry out loud just keep it out inside and learn how to hide your feelings and that's what we did we just shut up and went to work and dealt with it now we talk about you all behind your backs and we complain and curse you out uh, but with our out loud voices we just go to work and suck it up uh, my story is that i created a space for myself the community saw themselves reflected in me, created a larger community and so on and so on. Because that intention was set at its inception, BIPOC especially presumed that they are welcome and are a welcoming bunch to all in our values as an institution. Extending and presuming welcome. You can feel it when you walk in our doors from the parents, the staff and our mostly white faculty. 
we know that we all learn most effectively in spaces that welcome us. None of that means that we don't have situations because of racism, but that's a, another story for another day. Thank you, Lucinda. Um, Quanice, I may, I may turn it back to you. And just, just so you know, you had some snaps from uh, the attendees who are tuning in about what you uh, just shared. So I wonder if uh, thinking along in that same vein, if there are other tangibles maybe that you might uh, suggest about if, if Quanice were to, to rule the world as it relates to arts education and arts programming, what would that look like? Sure. Um, so just to answer the question in, in general, like I don't wanna see program expansions Right, like, and the reason I say that is because there has been so much harm and racial violence that has happened um, in arts education, in the classical music world, like all of the above, right? And so we have to, even to get to that next point of like actually uh, implementing anti-racism, racial justice into our organizations, into our work, we have to acknowledge the harm that we've done. There's major institutions out there that have yet to say, we effed up, we're sorry. You know, we recognize the harm that we have put onto people of color. We've silenced them. We've, uh, we've put glass ceilings so that it can't break through. We've like done all of that. Um, and we have yet to see that acknowledgement. And I think that acknowledgement and that apology is the first step for us moving forward with all of these initiatives and programs. Because other than that, I like, if I see a new program and I'm, for an example, if I see a big institution who comes out with a new program saying, hey, we're doing a BIPOC uh, program fellowship to help get you know more arts educators into the scene, I'm gonna see that as performative. I don't need to see performative work. I need to see real work and I, and real work requires acknowledging history, understanding history and moving forward from that. So being able to say, I am sorry, we apologize. We understand that our organization has systematically and historically left voices out on purpose. So that's my spiel. I, I agree. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, Armando, do you have things also to to add on to this or extending this conversation? Well, um, I just want to just thanks Lucinda and Quanis for this conversation and Quanis and just the the I want to say what I heard and how I feel when we talk about those issues, which is I feel a lot of pain and hurt um, because of the system as a 50 year old man that I've been playing in most of my life. A majority, more than a majority of my life has been doing this to us and, and me and othering me. And I could hear it in your voice too. I'm really hurt and I'm really sad and I'm, I'm angry. And, and this is a system I have to work with and I'm supposed to make a living and I've been dedicating my whole life to. And I'm hurt, I feel a lot of pain from it. And I just wanna acknowledge that a, how a lot of us artists feel, including the you know all the artists that are part of Quintato Latino have this similar perspective. Um, I think that um, uh, to promote in the field, what I'd like to see, if I move to like what a solution looks like for me, it's about um, power sharing and who's making the decisions in our systems. So um, I know for me as an artist, I try to exude that what in, in, in any of the places we are that I'm acknowledging what powers I have and which ones I can share to give voice to disenfranchised communities and communities that aren't heard or individuals that aren't heard, you know, even quieting myself. And I want to try to model that behavior and share that that um, tool. And, at, and right now, I just try to go to who's the highest in power that I can sway influence over. And because those people in power are the ones truly making the decisions for everyone down below, the people who are holding the purse strings and who are making the decisions. And when they're woke, and those people are diverse, and we're listening to diverse voices, and people in power are diverse voices, then it's just gonna trickle down and be so natural. We don't have to have initiatives like the ones you were saying. We don't need to do that, because the people in power are already coming from a diverse voice and making in their decision-making. And I just wanna, I'm trying to work towards that, acknowledge my own power, and having my even um, my uh, uh, cohort of artists acknowledging their power, and actually, how do we build power together as artists of color 
to build to have influence on the field like we're doing right here with the four of us so i and i think that i mean there's just so so many things i'd like to see i think the theme is giving voice to the folks that are most disenfranchised in our communities and and to Kwanisa's point dealing with all of our pain and our sadness and our hurt around that and um, and making an amends so that the 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 field makes an amends towards that and the beginning of that is acknowledging that it happened and actually handing over power the way i do that in communities is guess what i'm just quiet and i listen with an open heart i stop talking and i listen to the communities that i want to share my power with how about that as a as a program <laughs> for the people in power. power listen <laughs> and stop talking and do what they're saying do what the 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 what we're saying okay thanks <laughs> Armando. you remind me so much about um for, for whom we are speaking to right um when we talk about the field it, it can seem as though it's this monolithic um giant institutions but it's it's made of people and so as an individual person what is your capability um, to, to engage with this kind of work. It, it can easily be listening, right? And uh, having deep relationship and understanding and giving voice and giving power as an individual to, to someone else. Um, so a lot of what seems to be current conversations around anti-racism and around uh, lofty ideas and new initiatives start so incredibly personal. Um, and I think the... Uh, Mis mismatch sometimes with trying to do large scale things, trying to have a highly visible, lots of um, dollars attached to it without that just genuine personal connection and genuine, genuine intrinsic personal connection is, is very uh, problematic. And, and we see a lot of that also to, to Quinita's point. Um, I, I would love to sort of shift a little bit thinking that we talked about the field and other things and, and you know, sort of what's out there, but thinking really personally, all, all of you are founders and leaders and movers and shakers, certainly in um, your, your own right as, as musicians and, and the organizations that you're affiliated with. Armando had mentioned for 18 years, going on 20, right, with, with uh, Quintessa Latino. So for some time, some substantial amount of time, I'm wondering from your uh, very, very personal experiences, what uh, challenges you've experienced, what growths you've you've learned, what perspective shifts you've you've personally had and have seen uh, in your in your work as it relates really to the foundation with your missions uh, and who you are um, the, these years, if not decades. So, Quanis, uh, you, would you like to sort of share a little bit of personal stories here? Sure. Um, I would say some challenges is that some people just need to get the hell out of the way. And they don't um, they don't recognize that they need to get out of the way so armando spoke about like the gatekeepers right and the shifting of power and you know some of these people have been in positions for 30 20 30 40 plus years and they're not comfortable with the fact that the field is actually shifting and when i say the field is shifting i mean the field is speaking up and speaking out um and and it's, sometimes it's time it's time for you to retire it's okay it's all right. You did a great job from 1962 until 2020, right? Like you did a fabulous job, but now it's time to really give up that power and to move out of the way. And that's one of the challenges is that there are so many folks who are gatekeepers who don't want to give up that power. They don't want to give up that spot. Um, and so like, it just, it just, uh, that is a pitfall to the field, right? Like, if we continue to have the same people in the same spaces who are continuing to be the gatekeepers and making the rules and creating the policies and that we continue to listen to over and over and over again, we're never going to change. Um, yeah, we're never going to change. Um, and then also another piece of that is like the militant side of me is like, yes, um, I agree with Armando, there is a lot of hurt and a lot of pain, but there's also a lot of joy. And nobody talks about that joy that we have as people of color when we come together in that space. And that joy is so powerful that it creates opportunities for us to continue to build within ourselves. And so that power no longer is in the, the folks on the outside, the power starts shifting towards us and the, the work that we do within ourselves and our communities. So those are kind of some 
Yeah. I, I think that's beautiful. Yeah, it snaps all around and, yeah. and really amplifying each other, similar to what we're doing now, amplifying each other with the power and strength of, of unity, of community. Beautiful. Armando, um, same, same sort of question for you. Things either personally that you have seen as challenges over your 18 uh, tenure with Quinteto Latino or other things sort of out in the field. Thanks, thanks, Juanis, for mentioning the joy of that. I love, I love, and that as a superpower, uh, just is, is so inspiring. Um, you know, Quintet Latino started as a chamber ensemble, and because I wanted to play Latino composers, because I had been taught white male composers to best of my knowledge, a hundred percent, growing up, a hundred percent, and um, I didn't feel like there was a place that I could be represented in the thing that I do for wanted to do for my life, playing the horn. And so I started playing Latino composers. And, and in building that Latino branding, I realized that there was a, a big hole in the field around speaking for Latino voices and nurturing them in the field. And that's why we, I turned eventually to address that core issue more than repertoire. It's, it's a much bigger problem than repertoire. And so, and why I have an advocacy organization, Latino Music Education Network with the Chamber Ensemble now. Um, and I would say that some one some of the things I the biggest one of the biggest gifts I like to talk about because I think it's um, it's telling is in within the our system as a country and as a culture we so often um, see Latinos or other folks of color as monolithic as all the same with the same opinion and the same ideas in the same language and the same culture and we're categorized into this little into this little hole and if you so, so when when we're approached we're seeing both positive and negative parts of that you know we're approached with that with that framing and and that filter already and that has really been a tough thing for quinta latino our, our titles in spanish i'm a brown man when i go to spaces I'll, i must be a jazz artist right Okay, no, I'm not a jazz artist. I play art music. Okay, so then you're like playing salsa and merengue. No, I'm not. The music sounds just like all other art music and commission pieces. And it persists today, even to today. So I think that's, um, you know, just something that I have this conversation over and over again. In order to survive that, I just, I just accepted my role as an educator at all the different levels. Even when I'm on the board chairing a conference, it's still the same thing. I'm still perceived in the same way. So um, um, that the, see, the problem of being seen as monolithic as those stereotypes. And, um, and I think that's, that's good. I got plenty more, but I, that's good. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Armando. And, and I saw Quinny's nodding and Lucinda and, and certainly my, myself as well. I didn't share in, in the opening. I'm, I'm art, artistic and executive director of Castle of Our Skins, which is a concert educational series that celebrates Black artistry through music going um, now now in midway in its eighth season. Same, same conversation, same sort of perception, misperception and same um, identity that I need to carry and uh, as, as an educator in all spaces whether it's as an executive sort of leadership role or in a kindergarten classroom, but carrying the role of educator uh, as it relates to culture. It's, it's a heavy burden, but one that is, as, as you said, still needed very much today. Um, Lucinda, I don't think we heard from you. Is that correct? So uh, That is correct. Yeah, so with regard to challenges, um, of course, we have had some challenges are still having challenges. The one I choose to talk about is the challenge of funding. Um, as a Black-led not-for-profit organization, um, years of trying to figure out what's wrong, the reason with us, the reason why we can never seem to get to the $500,000 mark while we watch other organizations just like ours, but not just like ours, they're white-led organizations, not-for-profits. Organizations go into the millions. Um, who's work is just simply not like our work. Um, I think the word is called gaslighting. You all help me with this terminology. Uh, so just wondering like the goals, like what is it? Is it, is it right? Like, what is it? So finally knowing um, that, you know, 
is not anything wrong with our writing. <laughs> These highly educated folks, there's nothing wrong with their writing. There's nothing wrong with what we're doing. Um, there are statistics um, that I later found out around how many, what the percentage is of white led organizations that get um, certain amount of funding versus people of color led organizations. Um, so that was our challenge. That is our challenge now. But honestly, I'm looking for other funding models. This, I think this funding model in general is hard for everybody, especially people of color. And I'm, I'm really personally not interested. There's got to be another way um, to raise money. I'll, I'll let Armando or Quanis jump in if they have any thoughts. I, I was just, I'm, I'm really inspired by that, Lucinda. And, you know, these are, these are deep entrenched systemic problems we're dealing with, you know, and we have this discussion on our team and, and, and with our, even our cohort of artists around, do we build our own systems and start over or do we work in the ones that exist? And we kind of go back and forth. And, um, but this, this concept of funding, you know, for it, in the United States, 1.1%, 1.1% of philanthropic dollars go to Latino led, Latino serving nonprofits. 1.1%. Almost 20% of the population is Latino. Over 50% of the students in California are Latino students. Okay, so if we uh, just want to make that clear, and that's very similar numbers for other BIPOC and LGBT led organizations and serving organizations. And I think that both I said it and, and Ash said it, you know, we as leaders of color are tapped out. We're tapped out, you know, we're underfunded and asked to do more at a higher level than white led orgs and white led nonprofits across the board. As a convener of leaders of nonprofits around the country myself, I get to interact with a lot of them and they all say the same thing and um, that, that we're saying here. And this is the, again, these are deep entrenched systemic problems, you know, whether it be how we're asked to write, like you mentioned, like we're, we're, our writing is fine, our reporting is fine, or whether how we're asked to report, you know, and really who set up those systems? It wasn't us, who set up the system of funding? Who set up the reporting? Who set up the how you're gonna ask um, the, the writing, the language used to ask for money? It wasn't us, these are white led, white serving, white entrenched, white set up systems, white funded. And, and that's where a majority of the money goes. Can I jump in? Okay, so um, what we're talking about is capitalism and capitalism is white supremacy, right? Like that's literally what we're talking about. Um, and so talking, um, just piggybacking off of what Lucinda said earlier, there are ways outside of capitalism and people don't think about it, right? Like, whoa, cap, we're not gonna be a capitalist society. Oh, you must be communist. No, that's not how it works, right? Like there is a community in Seattle called the Autonomous Zone and they are living an anti-capitalist society. They are literally, they've built, after the George Floyd protests and uprisings, they built a community within a four block radius of Seattle that no longer has any type of authority because the police precinct had been evacuated. Nobody, there's no authoritative piece. Whenever someone needs, you know, food, they grow, they have a garden, they help support one another through their garden. If somebody needs a nurse, there's a nurse on call who's able to help and support. So there is a very collaborative anti-capitalist structure that has been built through that autonomous zone that we haven't even considered as an American society. And it's working for them. Um, and so like people are so afraid of that. Like we're so used to, you know, you work hard, you pull yourself up by your bootstraps, you get the money, you get the job, you're supposed to be where you're supposed to be, right? That's the American dream. But there are other, and even thinking us as people of color and our history, right? Like my family is Gullah Geek. Gullah Geek is based in Charleston, South Carolina. And those tribes came from Western Africa, mostly Ghana. And a lot of our um, traditions have been based in collaborative community mutual aid. So I wanna, I wanna pre make another emphasis of that, mutual aid. And there has been an uprising in mutual aid opportunities for 
um, different communities, particularly BIPOC communities. And yes, we are we are not a monolith, but these have been popping up because this is innate in us, honestly. Capitalism is not innate in us. Community and collectivity and collectivism is an innate in us. Um, and so uh, what you speak of, Lucinda, about uh, other funding like thoughts or funding models, like there are things that have historically worked and because of imperialism and colonialism and white supremacy have been shifted to make that capitalist structure. So just kind of wanted to put that out there. Great, great thoughts again, Cornice, and thinking about uh, if, if we had an Afrocentric mindset in, in leadership and, and uh, community and how systems are run in this country, what, what that could look like, right? As opposed to having this very white uh, supremacist uh, under under structure for literally everything in this country. Um, I, I have just one other sort of final uh, question before we have time for audience Q&A. So if you haven't already dropped in some questions in the chat, we do have time and would love to hear from you. And for, for this sort of final question, just thinking about really in, in any sort of um, whatever moves your heart to be able to share a final takeaway or a piece of advice that you would like to offer those that, that are listening. Uh, and while we don't know who is listening, you can sort of pick and choose your audience if, if, if that makes sense for you. Uh, as it relates to deepening one's uh, understanding, one's lived experience as it relates with racial, racial equity work, anti-racism work, um, for those that may be wondering what to do next for those that have been doing this for years, how to keep that energy alive. Any sort of final takeaways that you might be able to uh, pass along and share before we take some audience Q&A. So Armando, if you want to jump in first. I, I think what comes to mind here for me is a couple of things. One is the, I'm kind of actually the same thing I've been saying this whole time. Okay. First, after being a lifelong classical musician and being 50 years old, the people I want to talk to now are the ones in power. Everywhere I go, you want me to do some work with Who is in charge? Because I want access to them, okay? And I want to be talking about the issues with them. Who owes the purse strings, especially the board members, the EDs, the philanthropy? I, that's who I want access to and to talk to about these issues. And the other thing is, so when I'm having those conversations there, I am leading from the voices that I'm in service to, not necessarily just from me in my own perspective. I can talk from my own perspective, but I'm listening first to the voices, to my, to my constituents of Latino classical musicians, to my students, to the communities I'm in service to, to and, and, and making that a part of my voice. And that's what I think is, can be done by the field in general, which is, again, to be quiet, listen to your BIPOC folk, okay, and your LGBT folk, and, and, and listen with an open heart, ready to learn, not listen to stop, or listen to uh, uh, tokenize or listen to um, say, no, we can't do that. Listen with a heart open to the, that the world may be different than the one we grew up with and the one we've been, the colonized systems we've been perpetuating. It can look different. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Lucinda, do you have sort of final takeaways that you'd like to share? I do. Thank you, Ashley. I, my, I think my um, audience for this question would be educators who are also entrepreneur, entrepreneurs. Um, so as an entrepreneur, so a not-for-profit is a business and there's a balance <laughs> that in my story we had to find between making sure we always paid everybody's paycheck on time and um, fiscal responsibility. And there is a balance that um, we had to strike between um, not saying your truth so that you can continue to pay your mortgage um, because your truth would offend certain people um, and white people are the certain people i'm talking about what i've had to say over the past 23 years um, would have been very offensive um, to people and we made certain decisions because we needed to keep paying students coming in the door and that just was our reality um, I hope that moving forward with um, educators who are also entrepreneurs, um, that you're able to speak with your out loud voices, 
um, bold and unapologetically the truth um, while still being able um, to have multiple streams of income um, and income generation, um, both in funding and um, tuition driven, tuition driven uh, resources and individual donors. Um, so, yeah, I hope you all young people um, keep talking loud and out loud. Likewise, I, I will <clears throat> second that with a snap. Quanice, final thoughts before we take some audience Q&A? Yeah, um, I guess some of the final takeaways I would say would be to, um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll give two sets of takeaways. One will be for folks who, are, who identify as white and are working in arts education. You have to be genuine about your work. Do I have the answer of what genuine looks like? No, because I'm not in your community, but you need to figure that out. There's a lot of readings out there that you can do, talk to people, like build genuine, authentic relationships with your community. Um, for the BIPOC folks, um, I would say, let's keep uplifting each other. Let's keep reaching out to each other. Let's keep building and supporting one another um, because that we all we got. At, at this point. Um, and so hopefully we can get to a place where we all can work collaboratively together and work towards racial justice together. But there's so much work that needs to be done on both sides separately before we can even come to build together. So. So, so beautiful. And I think that directly relates to actually two questions that we have from audience talking to non-Black um, people, how they can decenter. Uh, whiteness in in uh, narrative and how without being performative, doing performative action, how they can understand the difference between performative action and real effective change, genuinity, as, as you said, right, and authenticity. Uh, and I wonder if really for anyone, if you have other thoughts speaking directly to non-BIPOC non people. I know we've shared quite a bit. Uh, during this panel, but Armando, any anything else you'd like to it, add on to that? For me, for me, it's easy. It's exactly what I said. Just be quiet and listen, and do what they say. It's there's the formula. Okay, hand over the money, hand over the power, help over decision making, trust, be take a risk. The, this kind of change is expensive. It's time consuming. It's heart consuming. Heart consuming too. You know, and our spirit and the power that we used are used to holding. We have to give that up at least partly for some of the, and listen from those communities that you're trying to represent. Involve those people in the decision-making or hand over the decision-making. Lucinda, Quenis, any, any other things to add on to this? I think this work is very personal for all of us, reflective um, on yourself. And if you are a white identifying person, the work starts with yourself. Um, if you have to find a person of color to talk to, that's telling as well um, that you don't have those people in your spaces so on a regular basis. So I would work, work on yourself and, um, and, and it's hard work and reflected um, what you've believed, your beliefs and your unconscious biases or your conscious biases um, reflecting on what you've been told your whole life about people of color. And then I'll just um, add to that. Stop asking us what you need to do. There's too many resources. There's Google, there's videos. Um, was it Jane Elliott? She talks about race all the time. Stop asking us. Stop. I just, I don't, and we don't owe you an answer at the same time. So. Thank you, Gwenis. Um, another question, and to paraphrase a bit, have um, any, any of you seen an example of a predominantly white institution sort of make a shift to being a minority white institution? Um, anything that you've, that you've seen as maybe an example to share uh, in thinking about recruitment and beyond recruitment, but retention and creating a, um, uh, a fertile space where unity can actually happen. Any any examples to be able to offer and, and share? Lucinda says no. 
I mean, I'm going to give the example of Chamber Music America. I just cycled off that board about a year ago. And in the six years I was there, I saw this huge shift in how they fund, in what the color like of the board like completely changed, in what they're funding, and um, and it was it was um, led by staff, and and um, and pushed by funders, and that's what made that happen. I just that's a great example of their putting um, you know their programming and their money. Um, in this issue and putting at the front of everything they're doing, everything, everything, every concert, every program, every decision, they're looking at it and, and uh, really see, it's an amazing shift. I think that's, that is probably a discussion for another time because as I look at, as we look at succession planning for my position, I, I do not um, want it to be a white led organization. Um, I would like it to be a BIPOC led organization. Um, and a lot of times I would question organizations that start out as black led organizations. And over time, when um, money and funding increases, you see a shift in who is in charge. Um, I have a personal experience with that. Hmm. And I'd love to continue those conversations on what happens when organizations um, when their funding increases, lots of other people get involved as well. Um, I have one more question for Armando specifically as it relates to Quinteto Latino. Um, the question is, how does Quinteto Latino advocate and represent those who are Afro-Latino or Afro-Latinx? Uh, are there you know, any trainings to combat the anti-Blackness in the Latino Latinx communities? Good. That's such a good question. So we have a problem here because at, being the only Latino led, Latino serving advocacy organization in the United States with five part time staff, it's, it's a huge, huge lift. And, and for all the systemic issues and f funding issues that we've mentioned here and all the barriers, it's really hard to move forward and represent. And, and Latinos are so diverse. I feel like I'm a third generation Mexican. Thank God I speak Spanish because it gives me a lot of access and cachet in so many Latino communities, enough Spanish to get by. And I feel so often like a chameleon in the Latino community. Like, if I'm in the education space, there's a bunch of Venezolanos, right? Because there's so many from Venezuela here or in, in, in just representing all different kinds of Latino community and the way they speak and what they eat and where we live and where we're from and the, and the color differences between the coasts and the different regions. It's, it's a huge lift. So um, I, I've been generally quite broad and not specific in, in, in for Afro-Latinos but just brought in having them included in the voice of our that I'm that I'm listening to, but it's a good point and definitely uh, um, an, an important part of of our systems and and in terms of especially in terms of race and, and you know we talk about skin color all the time at Quinta Latino even in our concerts okay it's it's an important part of uh, um, and 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 racism in everything we do so. In, in that way, it, it is represented and talked about. I'd love to develop a bunch of programming like this completely. I'd love to give like what we were even talking about, maybe giving our first like webinars and selling them because there's so many asked to us for this information, you know, but with just capacity, like all of us, it's a capacity issue. It's a funding issue. Yeah. Sounds like you need more people to be advocates. <laughs> Or fun, I want funders to be advocates. How's that? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I got um, the people. I got the people. I just need the funding. I'm not going to ask them to work for free. You know, I need the funding. Yeah. Sure, sure. And and having more organizations similarly minded as as you and more people, yeah. not not organizations, more people. I should say, since people run organizations similarly minded as you. Um, we have another question, and this I might pose first to, to Lucinda, but certainly uh, I think Quanis and Armando, you'd have great 
thoughts on this as well, but this is coming from an uh, orchestral director uh, and also equity leader at a performing arts school. How do you think within the structures of education can schools engage students and faculty in being proactive and anti-racist practice within the scope of performance? Um, and I'll pose that first to Lucinda and I, I see Quanice and Armando also gears turning as well. <laughs> well, my answer is I don't know. So while I think uh, maybe Kwanis can go um, first on Ar Armando, I don't know the answer to that question. I can go. So <laughs> um, educate. Uh, so I'm getting my doctorate in educational policy, and educational policy is what often frames the structures and the systems within public education. And so when we think about public uh, education, we have to build coalitions so that we are at our school board district meetings, right? Like we need to be at those meetings talking about the power of the arts. We need to be at those meetings talking about why anti-racism is important. We need to like build up our community structure. We need to build up our parent structure. If you have a PTA, like there has to be collaborative uh, advocacy happening on the school level but being seen on the district level and so i think as an orchestra teacher you i don't know if you have time i'm i'm just making an assumption that you might have extra time if you don't that's okay i understand COVID and school right now aren't the best of friends so um but if you have that extra time work with the parents and the community members in your community to say hey we have some upcoming uh you know school board meetings how can we make sure that the voice our voices are being heard and how what are the main talking points do we need to convey so that our school board takes what we say um seriously right and then also reach out to other schools there might be there's a lot of things happening on the grassroots level in the schools level that people don't even know about and you might be in the next community over and they might they might have a whole coalition built up already so see what's going on in the other communities around you and work with them because educational policy is where it's going to start at because there's so much policy out there that right now that's so damaging and harmful to our students that we need to re-examine and we need to point that out to public school board members because some of them don't even know what it is, right? Some of them are, don't even have an experience in a classroom and they're creating policies and don't know the implications and the effects of it on our students. Beautiful, and, and so much of that translates to other, I mean, just thinking about politics, et cetera, who, who is making decisions which are affecting, oh, vast majority of people with whom they have no relationship with. Um, very, very poignant words, Quinice. And Lucinda, I saw that you came off mute. Do you have other things to share on this? Yep, a, a very simple um, direct answer would be, you have to hire um, Afrocentric people in order to be African-centered um, from the start. So wherever I am is African-centered. There. It, it just is um, because of my life. Um, and then um, this is to people of African descent. You have to constantly interrogate and question your own proximity to whiteness and what your relationship is with whiteness. Um, because just because you're a person of color um, does not necessarily mean you have um, people of African descent um, best interest at heart. That's a whole nother conversation. That's another conversation. <laughs> we only have seven more minutes. So I think okay. I'm going <laughs> to gloss over that one. But yes, we can have a panel on that one. Armando, if you have things as it relates in an educational sort of sphere. Well, and I noticed the question was about anti-racist practice within the scope of performance. So I'll get a little micro. I like that um, you guys were very broad and I appreciate that. And one, you know, the one thing is the diversity of the um, music teachers, right? They're uh, in the U.S. Uh, um, you know, more than three quarters white are the music teachers. So, um, in terms of who's making the decision and how they're performing it, and the cultural competency of those folks, it's 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 around who again who's in power and it's who's making those decisions. All of us are saying those same things. I want and and because I get this repertoire question constantly, literally multiple times a week, I get asked about repertoire, and I have a. a wonderful, beautiful colleague that many of you may know named Rod Vester from Prism Ensemble. And recently he wrote something and I asked him, can I use this when I'm talking about this question? 
And I, I, I left him a voicemail like after in the first five days, I used it like a dozen times because it's so prolific. And what he was saying was about in terms of just adding BIPOC composers to your repertoire with no real inner work and understanding around what diversity, equality, equity, and inclusion does a disservice to you and everyone else without doing that inner work. And I'm just, that's, that's at the bottom line in terms of performance and, um, and, and, and integrating anti-racist practices there. It just, it takes inner work and, and this partnership we're talking about, all the stuff that Kuala Nisa and Lucinda talked about. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for that um, comment, Armando. And, and thinking with, from, from my perspective, very similarly, I get asked about, about repertoire quite often and um, can have a better framework at this point in, in my career to understand the genuinity, to understand the thought, to understand if someone is chasing a topical idea, if someone is um, trying to actually build a long-term relationship or seeing this as a sort of booster to their grant application because they've worked with a, a BIPOC-led arts organization and being very um, steadfast in my own beliefs and ideas and building my own community of, of support. So being able to turn away some of those um, opportunistic organizations that are working very visibly as opposed to very intrinsically in their work in anti-racism right now uh, and finding community with within other like-minded organizations. Um, I think we have time maybe for just one more question. And again, if your question wasn't answered, you have the session uh, panelists contact information, at least their name and affiliation, head to their website, find their contact, visit and go through all the tabs on their website, learn more uh, and feel free to reach out to them. I think this last question uh, that came in, I'll post to you, to you Lucinda, uh, on uh, your view on not only inclusion, but anti-racism specifically within Suzuki. Uh, and how you work to overcome the mentality at your own insti in institution and those Suzuki programs uh, around you. And you are muted if you wanna go ahead and unmute. Sorry about that. Good question. I'll come out with my confession. Um, Suzuki is a philosophy. Um, Suzuki um, is also like the Suzuki Association of Americas and these groups, um, I actually, don't affiliate with the groups a lot. So I don't have an experience with anti-racism in Suzuki because I don't participate with them a lot. Um, not for any other reason, but I'm hyper-focused on us and what's happening um, with us and around us. Um, whatever racist things that happened at our school actually happened more on an administ administrative level. Um, and, and we, and again, gaslighting, you don't know why it happened or why certain people um, voted a certain way and, and what's going on with that. Um, I hope I answered your question. I just don't, we have not done a lot of anti-racism work um, with regard to Suzuki. With this recent thing, um, with George Floyd and everybody deciding that racism exists, when I was asked to review people's statements, um, I refused. I don't want to uh, review your statement, especially if you hadn't made a statement before. Now is not the time to make a statement um, with Suzuki and anybody else. In maybe just the one minute that we have, in, in thinking about um, the repertoire, for instance, that's that's in the Suzuki, and it, yes, it is a philosophy, but it's also attached to certain tradition and certain um, ideals, often being around orality, which which is part of an Afrocentric praxis. But it, within the sort of Suzuki mindset, um, any anyone else, Armando Quanis, as it relates to Suzuki pedagogy and anti-racism. No. With regard to Suzuki pedagogy, there there is obviously a bunch of songs that you learn in order, and none of them <laughs> are by um, people of color, I don't think. They're folk songs or whatever. Um, my experience is I've been so hyper-focused on making you straighten your wrists and vibrate properly. I did not take the time to uh, for myself 
I did not take the time to delve into composers, um, diverse composers, um, until Rachel Barton um, came out with her series of uh, a companion series of composers of African descent that go along very well with Suzuki. So it takes time in a shift and for you to create time to have other thoughts than have your blinders on like I did um, and just focus on um, technique and creating music, whoever was the composer. Well, thank you for that, Lucinda. I think that's a good point to end on that it takes time to allow that process of perspective shifting to happen. And we are all in different sort of points as it relates to that time. So hopefully there were some thoughts and ideas shared to help encourage you and inspire you to keep up with that long-term process because it is a long-term process. Uh, thank you all of your Amanda Lucinda Kunis for, for this amazing panel. And thank you all for tuning in. Enjoy the rest of Sphinx Connect. Thank you, Sphinx. Thank you, Sphinx, for having us. Thank you. Thank you. All right.